So today I'm going to try to tell you about the uh, recent developments in our work to illuminate the druggable genome. And um, uh, this slide is inspired by a presentation that uh, Ron Margolis, who is in the audience, and I thank him for this idea, and other people had back in 2011 when Al Edwards had a commentary uh, in Nature. He pretty much looked at uh, 10 years past uh, the completion of the Human Genome Project and uh, noted that 75% of protein research is still focused on the 10% of the genes that were previously known. And that pretty much started the IDG program. And part of the IDG and one of the major components is what we would call informatics, data science and machine learning. And uh, some people call it AI, but uh, we can have a much longer conversation about the differences between AI and machine learning. But as you can uh, see from uh, this slide, uh, we use uh, this type of research, both in electronic medical record processing, as well as nosology, ontology, et cetera. So that's in the diseases pillar. Uh, on the targets pillar, we of course use it for what would be called target selection and validation in drug discovery. And then in the drug pillar, of course, we use it to identify novel therapeutic modalities. So within IDG, uh, we are developing methods that are applicable to each of these areas. So for example, uh, this project, which took us about uh, seven years uh, to complete, we essentially curated uh, all the known drug targets at the time that were available for uh, the FDA approved drugs, which again at the time was uh, about uh, 1600. Um, and that number of course keeps changing. Some of you might know that remdesivir was approved just yesterday by the FDA uh, to fight uh, COVID-19. So uh, we cannot say that this work is uh, ever completed. But at the time we looked at uh, more than 600 human uh, targets and more than 200 uh, non-human targets. And that led us to uh, participate in this uh, IDG program because we had expertise in how to annotate the proteins. As you can see from this uh, table, uh, there are uh, three experimental groups within IDG. Uh, one focuses on gene protein coupled receptors, another one on ion channels, and uh, the third one on kinases. And this is now the production phase of the IDG consortium. So in addition to the experimental groups, also known as uh, drug Cs, uh, data resource uh, generating centers, we have an outreach component, a knowledge management center, which I uh, lead together with Avi Mayan from Mount Sinai, and uh, four cutting edge informatics technologies, or actually three cutting edge informatics technologies uh, grants. And in addition to that, there have been uh, to date uh, 32 RO3 uh, grants funded uh, through this uh, project. So part of this uh, work and uh, uh, the question that we asked ourselves was how can we use, uh, what do we know about proteins and when do we know that the protein has been uh, studied? And we proposed a knowledge-based classification system for, for proteins. And uh, in particular, if you look at uh, three o'clock on the inner circle. So I'm going to try to set up a pointer. So this particular spot here, uh, 3%, those are the mode of action drug targets, uh, which were subject of the nature drug discovery paper from 2017. And uh, on top of that, uh, there's about 7%, uh, the numbers keep slightly changing. So as of this year, we are up to 8%. Those are what we call TCAM. And these are proteins for which potent small molecules are available. The vast majority of the protein is what we call T-bio. Uh, we understand the biology of these uh, proteins. And then about one third of the protein is what we call T-dark. And uh, I'll explain in a second how we got to those criteria, uh, which would be here. Sorry, I had my slides slightly out of order. 
So the way we got to DKIM was essentially to ask the question, how many drugs uh, are available for a particular target class? And then what's the 90th percentile that covers most of the drugs in that class? So for kinases, that cutoff is roughly at 30 nanomolar. Uh, that number is roughly at uh, 100 nanomolar for G protein coupled receptors and for nuclear receptors. And it changes dramatically, it falls down to uh, about uh, 20 micromolar or uh, 10 micromolar for, for ion channels. So we had to use a sliding scale for that, for that purpose. Uh, and then uh, with respect to uh, dark proteins or what some people call the ignorome, uh, we asked the question, how much information do we have available? And we partnered with uh, Lars Jensen from the University of Copenhagen, uh, Novo Nordisk Foundation Center for Protein Research. And Lars had introduced this concept of a fractional publication count. And the way the fractional publication count works is that it essentially looks at a protein and uh, tries to establish whether that protein is accounted for in a publication. And say you have a, uh, subject uh, type two diabetes, and then uh, they only talk about the sulfonylurea one receptor, then uh, that paper gets a count of one for uh, the two genes that compose uh, this uh, protein, this drug target. But if that paper uh, talks about 20,000 proteins instead of one protein, then that uh, count goes as one over 20,000. So as you can imagine, uh, this avoids counting uh, as uh, well-described proteins, those that have been mentioned in papers that uh, talk about uh, the entire human proteome. So we have this criterion, the fractional publication count. We also look at the NCBI reference into functions. So we, they call those gene riffs. Uh, and those are uh, like summary uh, statements about the protein function. And then we also count the number of antibodies uh, available for a protein in antibodypedia.com. So if you match uh, uh, these criteria, you're in T-dark, and then you can jump out of it by uh, having two of these criteria passed. So you end up in T-bio. The other way you end up in T-bio if, if in the gene ontology, uh, experimental evidence for both molecular function or biological process. So if there is well understood mechanism for that protein, then it promotes, it's promoted to T-bio. So going back to the way, uh, the way we handle the data, we take uh, a lot of information from uh, large scale data sets. Uh, we have to uh, compose our own uh, drug target ontology and we use other ontologies as possible. For example, Monarch and the disease ontology and Uberon, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And when all that information gets processed, it gets deposited into a database called uh, Target Central or TCRD. And the portal for TCRD is Pharos. And uh, you can access Pharos directly at pharos.nih.gov. Uh, other related websites are druggablegenome.net. This describes our consortium. And then of course, Common Fund uh, slash IDG has additional information. We also collaborate, for example, with the International Mouse Phenotype Consortium, also known as COMP2. Uh, and uh, we are about to establish a relationship with a recently started uh, innovative medicines initiative project out of uh, the European Union called EU Be Open. Uh, these are the type of data that we uh, process and the ones that are colored in orange are recent additions to uh, our system. So, for example, the cancer cell line encyclopedia and the string database as well as ClinVar have just been added. And uh, of course, we continue to maintain and update information from uh, other resources, for example, GTEx, we had to migrate from GTEx 7 to GTEx 8 when that became available. So with all this in mind, the question is, do we actually believe this separation between uh, T-Dark and uh, T-Bio, T-Chem and T-Clean? And the answer is, at least as far as the data tells us, that separation is real. 
we started with uh, information from fractional publication counts. So in a way, it's not surprising that you see this differentiation when it comes to PubMed and GeneDrift and antibody counts. But then when you look at uh, the total gene ontology terms or when you look at the uh, distribution of genes into the text mindset from NIH reporter uh, filtered for about 40 plus thousand NIH grants, we also looked at uh, patent corpus from 2001 onwards. So this was full text for all the patents. Uh, and then the harmonizer, which is a set maintained by Avi Mayan at uh, Mount Sinai, which is essentially experimental data collated from about a hundred different data sets. So even when you look at experimental data, that separation continues to be present. And uh, there is a lot more information in what we call TCLIN and TCAM as opposed to all the others. And the statistical validation was performed to make sure that these tests were correct. There is a drift over time. So we started when we first wrote the proposal that got funded for the uh, pilot phase. Uh, the initial criteria included uh, TDARC had about uh, 9,200 genes and uh, TCLIN uh, had about 600. And then over time, you can see how this migrate uh, into TBIO, the majority of them. And then over time, some of TBIO migrate straight to TCLIN. And of course, some of uh, TCAM migrate to TCLIN. So it's not a necessary progression that you go from dark biochem uh, clean. There is another category here, which we call void. This simply has to do with the fact that uh, sometimes uh, a protein that's annotated in Uniprot uh, quotes uh, gets retired or becomes obsolete because it turns out it was a pseudogene. And so, and other proteins get migrated. So we have both going out of the void and going into the void over time. As I mentioned before, the vast majority of the information that we have is available through the FAROS uh, website. Uh, we primarily separate the information in three major categories, targets. I would say that targets is the best uh, accounted for facet diseases and ligands, and these are work in progress. And of course, you can access this data through an API and all the data that we provide in FAROS is uh, stored in what's called a machine learning ready format. So folks who are in the business of taking the data and processing at scale uh, can do so without hindrance. A more recent evaluation of this work was to ask the question, how many of the proteins that we know are associated with rare diseases? And uh, an outcome of that work was that uh, essentially together with Melissa Handel and the Monarch team, we evaluated information from disease ontology. Uh, this is uh, Lynn Schrimmel's project uh, at University of Maryland. Orphanet, this is based in Europe. Uh, GARD, this is the NCATS the rare disease database, the NCI thesaurus. Of course, OMIM, I assume everyone is familiar with that. And then Mondo itself. And we asked the question, how many of these are rare diseases that are what's called leaf terms in terms of ontology? And uh, we thus revised the number of rare diseases from 7,000 to over 10,000. Uh, we also looked at therapeutic modalities uh, and did a comprehensive survey of what's available. And part of that survey was uh, to realize, and this relates to a question that was asked by uh, the director of NCATS, uh, Chris Austin, which was, how are we doing with translation? So what you see here on this plot, the one that uh, the first line that goes up and up and up is the number of publications. This is on the log scale, of course, the number of publications that get added for uh, proteins and their association with rare diseases. So you can see that over the years, there's thousands and thousands of publications that are added. Uh, there is very little progress, however, and this is a period of uh, roughly 30 years. So the data goes from 1987 to 2018. Uh, there's not so much progress when it comes to diseases of uh, drugs approved for orphan drugs. So this covers the European Union, EMA approvals, as well as FDA. 
So there's clearly a gap between uh, science and translation. The other angle that we asked was, uh, can we evaluate the target space of rare diseases? And uh, it turns out about one third of the human proteome is associated with rare diseases. So we did a similar plot to the one uh, you had seen before. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, TCLIN and uh, TKM are almost double in percentage sense and TDARC is drastically reduced. And this, of course, has to do with the fact that uh, most of the proteins that are associated with rare diseases are much more studied, and there is a lot more information in OMIM, Orphanet, etc. What we found quite interesting was that uh, if you consider this 7%, what that really stands for is roughly uh, 400 genes uh, out of uh, TICLIN, which indicates that these genes are druggable because we know that there are drugs that work on these genes. And uh, the short of it is uh, these might actually serve as targets for rare diseases that currently do not have medication. It is not, of course, a given that uh, the drugs that already exist on the market on that target would work to restore the function of the disease since the majority of the drugs on the market are known to block function of targets. So that take home message, and I hope I convinced you that there is a knowledge deficit. Uh, about one third of the human proteome remains uh, poorly described and uh, Roughly 11% of the proteome are currently targeted by small molecule probes, whether they're small chemicals or actual drugs. So what we really think is that, for example, in rare diseases, we could make significant process, uh, significant uh, progress when it comes to translation. So now comes the fun part, and we're going to talk a little bit about machine learning. Uh, and uh, this expression uh, was uh, attributed to uh, W. Edwards Deming, but uh, it turns out it's difficult to establish without a doubt that he actually used that uh, uh, expression. We know that Bernard Fisher, a physician, said this to a journalist. Uh, sometime in the late 70s. So without data, we cannot uh, build machine learning models. So part of the problem when we try to build machine learning models is to try to understand uh, protein disease associations. And uh, in this particular example, which I just created this morning out of Pharos. So if you go to this uh, link that's down here, uh, it takes you to this potassium channel also known as uh, CUR 6.2. And uh, essentially, it illustrates uh, the diseases that are currently associated with this uh, channel. And of course, what we face as uh, scientists is the fact that the majority of the resources that are out there are gene and protein centric. And even though we track information out of 11 different channels, uh, and some of them are listed here, like Jensen Lab Experiment, uh, CTD, ERAM, these are all channels uh, that provide information for diseases, uh, this genet, et cetera. It turns out that uh, you really need to understand how these proteins associate in real life. So for example, to get to the fact that this is a target for glimeglamid, uh, which is uh, an anti-diabetic drug, you have to account for the fact that uh, this potassium channel KCMJ11 is associated with the uh, ATP binding cassette transporter C8, uh, which together they form the sulfonylurea 1 receptor. So the question, of course, is how to take all this information in, how to associate it, uh, and then uh, ultimately what we all try to answer is which of these uh, targets are clinically actionable. And the metaphor that uh, has been used in the past is that of the turkey and the butcher. Thanksgiving is about a month away. So think about it. Uh, both the turkey and the butcher are involved, but only the turkey is committed. So what we really try to do is find those targets that are committed. So once you hit them with a drug, you get a clinical response. And of course, the problem is that uh, a lot of these so-called protein disease associations are not related to that. A quick plug to a parallel resource that we've developed uh, 
and feeds into Pharos. This is Drug Central. So Drug Central is a, a resource that we built uh, over the past decade at the University of New Mexico. Uh, it indexes drugs and uh, what you see here in the little picture is remdesivir and we have uh, drugs in the news uh, and uh, you can visit the website and uh, uh, of course all the data that we have in Drug Central is also machine learning ready. So for example, if you search for glibenclamid, you will find information about the molecule, you will learn about its uh, admetox properties, uh, drug uses. We now separate the FDA adverse events by uh, male and female, which I believe we are the first resource in the public domain to make this uh, particular separation. We have a lot of information with respect to bioactivities. And in addition to that, we also uh, list the pharmaceutical products with links to daily med. So if you're interested to read the drug label uh, directly, you can do so. Uh, and another quick plug, uh, and I won't dwell too much into this, but this is a clear example of machine learning application. Uh, NCATS has uh, developed what's called the COVID-19 portal, where at the time we took the data, they had six different assays uh, related to viral entry, viral replication and live virus infectivity together with associated counter screens. So total, they had six different assays. And what we did was to take their data and build machine learning models using fingerprints, pharmacophore and physical properties. And uh, we have this uh, workflow and uh, that leads to a particular prediction model. And then we externally validated the predictions. So if you look at uh, the results of a prediction, you can type in a drug name or a SMILES or a PubChem CID. And what you get out is uh, input, uh, an output file that looks a bit like this. So the assay information is separated. And if you scroll further down, you actually see uh, what NCATS has to say about this. So in this particular case, we used uh, an amodiaquine metabolite called uh, N-monodesetyl amodiaquine, which we separately published uh, about a week ago uh, establishing its potent activity. So it's equally potent to remdesivir in what's called a viral titration assay. And we also provide the, the users with a visual on what would be important. So you want your compounds to be active in these three particular assays and inactive in the counter screens. And you can learn more about this at the Redial uh, website. So going back to information from Pharos, uh, of course, what we're trying to do is uh, establish how to turn this information into an actionable uh, resource. And we take a lot of information through Pharos and that relates, for example, to what we call the five branches of the knowledge tree, uh, genotype, phenotype, interactions and pathways, structure and function and expression. And all that data, then we try to link it with uh, phenotype or disease information, with uh, endogenous ligands or drugs, and of course, targets. And if you think of this as the subway map of Manhattan, uh, New York City, you could travel from a particular phenotype to a particular target in a particular pathway uh, along different lines. And each of these lines would be related either via expression, association, membership, etc. So. All of these uh, are relationships that uh, can be established. And this gives you a glimpse of the numerical components of what's currently in the system, but uh, we'll keep expanding it. So uh, this is not even the latest version of it. Uh, it's grown quite a lot since. I just uh, didn't have time to keep it up to date. But essentially, we have more than 300 million path instances across a large variety of resources. So once we do that, then of course we have to establish these relationships over time. And then we ask the question, how can we uh, travel along these paths, which is essentially uh, graph theory for uh, those who are interested in the mathematics behind it. So uh, the meta path is essentially a way to describe that you have a particular gene which regulates a particular biological process that plays a role in a specific disease. 
And of course, when you establish that multiple genes regulate the same process in the same disease, then you have multiple ways to travel that and you also link the two genes. But uh, it, you can further link that information with the fact that that particular gene is expressed in the tissue, which plays relevance for that disease. And uh, once we use this network topology, uh, what we have is uh, a degree of weighted path counts, which essentially looks like this. So for the relationships that are present, we can establish a direct relationship between say the sulfonylurea one receptor and type two diabetes. And then of course there are multiple ways you can travel along those paths. And then, I don't know, uh, just randomly saying ABCB1, which is a, a PGP efflux pump, uh, that would not necessarily be associated with type 2 diabetes. So therefore, that association would be absent, and we could consider this as a negative label. So for those that are positive examples, uh, we have the association present, and the other ones are negative. And the reason in this particular slide we have highlighted OMIM as the in yellow is that we consider OMIM uh, as the negative uh, source of labels for machine learning in absence of direct negative information. This is just a workflow that we developed based on uh, the FAROS data and uh, using Metapath, uh, which I just described earlier, and then XGBoost is the machine learning algorithm. And some of you may have heard of a uh, machine learning uh, algorithm called Random Forest. Uh, consider this to be the complete forest. So this goes through all the decision trees and enumerates them completely and then finds the ones that are the most relevant. And of course, it's not as fast as uh, random forest, but in this day and age, computation is not an issue. So essentially, we have four major steps. The database construction, which I explained, we used the Pharos. Uh, then we transform the metapaths into machine learning features. We create the model data sets, and these are all done in scripts in R and Python. And then last but not least, we actually run the algorithm and develop the, the results. Uh, so with that in mind, I just wanted to illustrate uh, the concept of artificial intelligence and perhaps the fact that we shouldn't be so afraid of artificial intelligence. Uh, those of us who uh, have been around for more than five decades have seen uh, Terminator and back in 1986 or whenever this movie came out, this was the first conceptualized Hollywood style on-screen display, which was pretty cool. So there's clearly a lot of advances that have been made in terms of uh, artificial intelligence, but I don't think uh, artificial intelligence is bad. And uh, I don't think we're even close to, to getting there as much as the hype uh, and certain people promote the hype. In fact, if you, search, do a Google image search for bad AI, certain individuals show up. Uh, I'll briefly tell you about uh, a model that we built for Alzheimer's. We got an NIH uh, supplement for this. So we essentially, we started with the data set that uh, I, I showed earlier. For the training set, we used 53 genes that uh, we could find associated with Alzheimer's and then uh, about 4,000 genes from OMIM associated with other pathologies, which means we assume them to be negative for Alzheimer's. And then we used 23 genes from text mining that we found associated with Alzheimer's. Of course, there's no overlap between these sets and 200 negatives. And uh, when we built a model, we built uh, two different models. And then we asked the question, which one of these gives us an answer that's closer to what we know from text mining. And it turns out that what we call the weighted model uh, gives uh, a better information. So it correctly predicted 20 out of the 23 uh, positives and 159 out of the 200 negatives. This also illustrates uh, one of the problems that perhaps is not often mentioned in machine learning. Uh, this is called the confusion matrix. 
And as much as you want this to be as close to the original, so 20 out of 23 and 159 out of 200, it doesn't sound that bad. This is closer to more than 90% that this is close to 80% uh, accuracy in predicting the, the true label. However, this also points out the fact that your chance of being right is one in three because you have these uh, true negatives that are predicted to be positives. That's called a false positive. So when we set up to uh, validate the model, uh, we said we wanted to look at uh, 20 different genes because we thought that if we look at 20 different genes, we have a chance one in three of being correct. So going back to what the model is trying to teach us, this is what's called the uh, variable importance plot. So the top three are gap DH, interleukin 10, and uh, this is a glutathione related uh, protein. And further down here, you see JAK2 kinase. Uh, uh, this is a BDNF. This is a uh, neuro uh, north nerve growth factor. I forgot what the name of it is and IL2. And of course, there's some information that if the gene is expressed in the anterior cellular cortex, uh, so again, uh, this was a positive association. So the fact that it's expressed in the cortex is required. That was uh, somewhat encouraging. But what's interesting uh, to my mind is the fact that JAK2, IL-10 and IL-2 suggest the uh, inflammatory response. And then you also have uh, this glutathione suggesting oxidative stress. So taken together, when you have oxidative stress and inflammation, what that is also indicative is possibly infection. And some of you might uh, have followed the recent stories about the possibility that Alzheimer's is caused by herpes uh, simplex virus infection and uh, uh, other, some, some people have found bacteria uh, that could cause this. So we pretty much set up to do experimental validation. Uh, since I'm not the scientist that conducted these experiments, I'll probably not do justice to the way the data was uh, curated and uh, assembled, but essentially uh, we looked at three different ways to, to validate this. We did um, shRNA uh, for the gene of interest and we try to perturb it so in the absence of that gene we looked at uh, we try to ask questions uh, and then we looked at the hyperphosphorylation of tau protein with uh, two different antibodies that look at uh, serine 199 202 and 205 and uh, essentially we also looked at uh, western blots and uh, these are uh, cells that uh, have been uh, tested. But out of these experiments, uh, we found uh, certain genes that uh, were expressed uh, and have an influence in, in Alzheimer's. And then we validated that with the qPCR on uh, the same set. But we also looked at uh, uh, cells collected from brain autopsy from patients with Alzheimer's disease. and. Uh, we found uh, similar results on, and uh, just to make it uh, a long story short, this is a overview of the different pathways in which these genes that we predicted. Uh, so these are 20 genes that in the primary literature were previously not associated with uh, Alzheimer disease. And uh, the short of it is we believe that uh, uh, these three genes uh, PIBF1, LILA3, and CRTIM are, have the most significant effect on tau phosphorylation. And they seem to point out uh, immune pathway implication in uh, the Alzheimer's pathology. And uh, maybe this is boring to the NIDDK audience, so I thought I'll tell you uh, more about uh, another model which we built for uh, type 2 diabetes. So, Essentially using the same methodology as for Alzheimer's, we started with uh, 51 genes that uh, were extracted from OMIM. And uh, we consider the other 4,000 genes as the negative set. Uh, we didn't do any external validation. So we, we literally applied this. And then we asked the question, how many of these genes uh, can we predict? 
And so we built this model and uh, the top interaction here is a gene called hemoferritin. And uh, I thought hemoferritin also down here, you see hemoxygenase one. So these are related to iron transport. Uh, there's a rare disease uh, called hemochromatosis and people who get hemochromatosis uh, develop type two diabetes, I think 80% of them or more. So, uh, at least from that perspective, this model didn't seem completely wrong. And uh, so I took this model and uh, predicted uh, genes that were not present in the training set and sent about 300 predicted genes to Mark McCarthy. Uh, Mark is now a senior director at Genetic, but at the time he was leading the type two diabetes consortium uh, on behalf of the University of Oxford in England. Uh, and uh, when I sent him this data, he pretty much uh, told me that the general summary was there was no enrichment for type two diabetes associations from exome or GWAS data. Uh, and then we, they also had a question about the training set. So this was quite interesting. Uh, they thought that OMIM was not a reliable source of information when it comes to gene associations for type two diabetes. So what he did was he sent me a, a separate set of genes uh, and this was through his at the time postdoc Anuba Mahajan. So I got 54 genes from, uh, from them. These were uh, causal transcripts from uh, his uh, work and uh, Mark has published this type of work in Nature Genetics. And uh, out of this second model, a lot more genes of the ones that we predicted do have GWAS associations. Uh, the variable importance plot ranks at least to uh, this uh, transporter and the gastric inhibitory peptide receptor as relevant, uh, and they are also associated with type 2 diabetes. So in short, this second model is a lot more relevant to diabetes uh, compared to the first model. And so the take home message that I took from this is always talk to experts and don't believe a machine learning model just because it looks reasonable. And uh, these two models are really, really different. That's what I have to say about that. Another interesting part, and uh, these are models that were built in parallel. So essentially, uh, these are uh, data from the International Mouse Phenotype Consortium. And the advantage when you use IMPC data is if you have the genes with association with a specific phenotype, those are statistically significant. And every other gene that has been tested in that uh, IMPC consortium that doesn't have the phenotype, that's a true negative. So when we build models from uh, based on IMPC, we actually have true negative data as opposed to using OMIM. Remember, OMIM is pretty much a speculation on our part that we assume that these are not associated with the, that phenotype. So when you look at these data, uh, we have five phenotypes that are potentially associated with uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, some have to do with glucose, some with insulin, but the short of it is we found uh, different genes that were predicted uh, from these models, which uh, are also supported by GWAS evidence. So all told, we have, uh, I think, reliable uh, machine learning models that can support uh, a comprehensive model for type 2 diabetes. I couldn't resist putting this slide in. Artificial intelligence is not only used for biology, uh, so Macmira, which is a whiskey uh, maker out of Sweden, uh, is selling this particular type of whiskey called Intelligence. And uh, they list here, uh, if you look carefully at this picture, it says that the master blender was artificial intelligence. And what essentially what they did is they fed uh, Microsoft and Forkind uh, a lot of data about the recipes for their blended whiskey. And uh, out of the potentially 70 million combinations, number 36 was approved uh, by humans. So where this is all going, uh, I think the real revolution happened uh, back in uh, 2016 uh, or a bit earlier, uh, 2014, 
when uh, Tomasz Mikolov, uh, who at the time was at Google, he's now at Facebook, he came up with the efficient algorithm to encode uh, words. And uh, this is called word to vec and it's uh, widely used. Uh, we also have a version of word to vec that we use uh, internally. And uh, what made the news was the way that the algorithm was able to solve this equation, king minus man plus woman equal queen. And uh, to some extent, this sounds uh, uh, perhaps naive, but the fact that the computer could handle this uh, conceptual relationship uh, was quite uh, interesting. This allowed Google to build Google Translate a lot more uh, stronger than before. And uh, for example, there is an automated server that translates to Klingon, uh, which is a completely fictitious language. Those of you who watch Star Trek, uh, there's a new discovery uh, series uh, out on CBS uh, and uh, Klingon anyone translates to Tilhan Bay. And I think the way we will use this in the near future, I don't think we're far off, is that we will be able to solve this equation, human minus health plus disease equal patient to the point that I think we already have the precursor of this within IDG KMC. So we have a lot of data that relates diseases to genes. Uh, so we established the relationship between uh, phenotype and disease, and uh, we try to use it in a predictive way to try to develop what would be called artificial medical intelligence with uh, omics data biomarker information. And of course, uh, we rely a lot on literature data as well. So perhaps in the near future, we will be able to plug this into hospital EMR data to improve the patient service. Uh, I have uh, two seven-year-olds that interact with Alexa as if it was a person. And I think we're not far off the possibility where you interact with Alexa and uh, Alexa has access to your medical records and you say, hey, given my current health status today and my calorie budget, whether I'm over calorie budget or under, you know, overweight, underweight, what food could I shop and prepare today? And of course, Alexa could potentially handle that, come up with suggestions, and this would be also for the benefit of maximizing the health uh, status of the person. So this is my last slide. Uh, I think I tried to convince you that uh, the truth is out there. It's just not evenly distributed. This is both uh, kudos to X-Files and to uh, William Gibson who wrote Necromancer who said that the future is already there. It's just not evenly distributed. And uh, I think we can build predictivity models. Uh, we have to be aware that it could be different models uh, and the models will change as, as soon as you change the input, you'll change the output. So what we do is of course, we run multiple models for each disease and then we compare them. And uh, I think I convinced you that it's really hard to find the high quality data and even more difficult to find what's called the ground truth, which is true negatives, which are really important for machine learning. And if you don't have access to experts, try to find them because without them, all the machine learning models are useless. So with that, uh, I will be willing to answer any questions you might have. Thank you for your attention. So uh, there's some question in the chat. Let me read. Uh, first one is coming from um, Anita Bendrovsky. Uh, why are you looking at Antibodypedia as opposed to antibodyregistry.org? Um, very... I wasn't even aware of antibodyregistry.org. I'll be happy to take that information from you if available. I was made aware of antibodypedia.com back in 2013, and we got permission from them uh, to use their resource through the API. So uh, there was no hindrance in us using antibodypedia.com. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting notion of the fractional count. What is the method for that? Are you using mesh terms, abstract, or Fortex? If Fortex, how do you ensure yeah. complete? 
Uh, we have evolved uh, the method. This is developed by Lars Jensen, but uh, the next version of the diseases paper I will co-author. So I have uh, some more insight into that. Uh, so first, initially, we only used PubMed abstracts, but uh, we recently started to use uh, full text. We currently uh, have about 4 million uh, articles full text that we mine. Uh, we give different weight to information and assertions that are present in certain parts of the text, like introduction and conclusion. And uh, we also use uh, a BERT, which is a specific type of uh, vari bidirectional encoder to, to process the text. Uh, this was the real uh, text mining revolution of 2019. So we use something called BioBERT, and uh, we encode all the text. And then we also have uh, neural net trained dictionaries that try to tell us what are uh, false negatives. So we try to avoid, uh, for example, when we started to, to mine the, the text of R01 grants, uh, the top funded uh, gene was AIM1. And of course, AIM1 is a gene, but it's not something that you want to get out of R01 text mining. So I hope that answers the question. And so there's another question. Uh, can you please remind uh, what is T-Clean and T-Can? So T-Clean are mode of action drug targets and t -CAM are just uh, targets for which we know small chemicals. Uh, so for example, you have a small molecule that uh, I don't know, MK771 or whatever uh, is. Uh, these are known chemical probes, but they're not drugs. So that this is just uh, to differentiate between drug targets and those that can be manipulated in biochemistry and pharmacology assays, but uh, the chemicals are not on the market as drugs. Thank you. So one, one question from Diego Gilino. So thanks to the, for the great talk. Can you mention be can you can your method be applied to genetic diseases for which not kosher gene is known? For example, molecularly uncharacterized disease. Uh, we are looking into that quite a lot. Uh, for example, just this morning, I was preparing a data set based on uh, gene expression from chondrocytes uh, because the investigators are interested in finding uh, more information about rheumatoid arthritis as well as uh, arthritis uh, in general, like the geriatric type and to try to understand what would cause those diseases and how to action them therapeutically. So uh, quite often the causal genes are not known, but you can still try to build a pathway or a network model based on the genes that are positively or negatively associated with that disease. So you still need input data, which is both phenotypic and transcriptomic. So without that, of course, you can't do much with machine learning. Mm -hmm. So another question from Marian. Uh, thank you for the excellent talk. How does the fact that much of the scientific literature is not reproducible factor into your knowledge? Do biases in data cause problems? Yeah. Uh, so there's two answers I'll, I'll have for that, Marianne. Uh, first one is uh, we are aware of something called the paper mills. Uh, so there's about uh, 600 papers that we have removed from our text corpus text mining based system because of that, uh, they follow a particular pattern. I don't want to point fingers, but the vast majority of the authors work at different hospitals in China. And there are, there's literature written about this, so you can read it. The other thing we monitor closely is retraction watch. And uh, part of the reason we, we use a fractional publication count of five or higher, it means that you would take at least five publications on that particular assertion to make it into our system. 
So even though we try to give higher weight to higher impact publications, we looked at this, it doesn't really help. In fact, quite often the papers that get retracted are the ones published in the super high impact journals. We find that the mid tier uh, journals uh, like Journal of Biological Chemistry, Molecular Pharmacology, those types of journals uh, tend to have more uh, reliability and papers get retracted less in, in those journals. Hopefully this answers the question. Um. Yeah, so um, one comment um, from Anita, there is no relationship between our size goal method score compared to impact factor. I'm not familiar with uh, that score, but I agree impact factor is not the prediction of the quality of the work. That's generally the case. Okay. So, uh, okay. Yeah, there's a comment in the chat. It just say thank you and agree thank you. Um, if you have question, you can unmute yourself or, or list in the chat. I can read for you. Um, hey, Koei, you missed Marianne's question about Alzheimer's. Oh, it wasn't a question. It was just a comment. <laughs> so I had had two comments in there. One was when you mentioned the virus uh, uh, connection. I remember when I uh, first was a graduate student way back in the 1980s, there were, I think, five hypotheses about Alzheimer's, and one of them was that it was a virus, and in fact, it was herpes because of the way the degeneration proceeded uh, along the pathways that we knew uh, could come in via the nose. So I thought it was interesting that we came back. And then when you made your comment about, well, you may not be interested in Alzheimer's and IDDK, I said, but isn't Alzheimer's now considered a type of diabetes, or at least that, uh, you know, that hypothesis had come up. So they were just comments. <laughs> Much appreciate that comment. In fact, uh, my immediate thoughts, so when the paper from Mount Sinai, and I remember that Joel Dudley was one of the main authors. So when that paper came out in Cell, where they looked at the patients from Mount Sinai and they found the herpes virus into the brains of people with uh, Alzheimer's, uh, I immediately thought, wait a minute, can we establish a relationship between uh, taking anti-herpetic medication and incidence of Alzheimer's? And um, it's already been done. We weren't the first, so we did publish, but uh, it seems that it offers protection on a 10 to one odds ratio. So if you take antiherpetic medication, you're less likely to develop Alzheimer's, which is really fascinating. And I'd be happy to explore if anyone on this call has data to, or a way to look into the possibility that uh, uh, an infectious agent causes type two diabetes. I think that would be fascinating. I know that 40 years ago when the idea came that maybe peptic ulcer is caused by an infection, people were laughing uh, about it, but it turns out, you know, it's H. pylori. So uh, I think maybe we haven't looked far enough into the pancreas or the beta-langerhans cells. Okay. 